The path of the living masters, how a formless God communicates with souls living in worlds of form today on the Sant Mat Satsang podcast, a production of Spiritual Awakening Radio. My name is James Bean. In the name of the great life, sublime light, be praised. A popular verse often found repeated in the Mandaean canonical prayer book, a beautiful collection of mystic hymns and poetry. In the name of the great life, their term for the supreme being, sublime light be praised. The great life is a Mandaean term for the supreme being, a variation of living one, the living one. Generally in the world of religion, the world of exoteric spiritual paths, institutionalized religions, are always looking back. It seems they're always heavily focused on the past to the time of some past teacher or scripture. This is rather odd if you think about it. Why would the pursuit of a living God and gaining the knowledge we need to live a good life in the here and now be so tethered to nostalgia about the past? Past teachers, past events, past scriptures, past stories and myth authored thousands of years ago. How could learning about a great feast someone enjoyed during the Middle Ages satisfy our hunger now? We have to make our own meals and not be content with menus. We need to have our own direct source of sustenance and not be content with stories about others. These stories, rather than being some sort of final destination of intellectual knowledge that some people agree with us about, and we get off on that, we enjoy that agreeing with others about certain facts or bits of information, creating the illusion of some kind of religious satisfaction. Instead of that being limited to that, which is where most people are at in the world of religion today, should at the very least, these stories should at the very least inspire us to write our own chapters in the book of the living, contribute our own verses to the book of life. As Rumi once said, don't be satisfied with stories, how things have gone with others. Unfold your own myth. Of course, Sant Mat, this path of the masters, is quite respectful of the great teachers, the great saints of the past, and the scriptures or hymns, the Banis, Kirtan, the Gurbani or Bhajans they left behind. And you'll hear more of them quoted on this podcast than just about any podcast out there. But the focus of Sant Mat is not in the past, but in the living present. Sant Mat greatly values living masters. Sant Mat exists because of living masters. Respect goes to past masters, yes, but the work's not done. The work that remains is the job of the living masters, the living ones of the present time, the living present, keeping the torch, the light of spirituality, lit for another generation or two. For Sant Mat, this path of the living masters, the age of truth and revelation has never ceased. What was true in the past remains true now. What enlightenment was available to others who lived in the past long ago is also available to us in the here and now in the living present. Standing at the crossroads of time, we must make a firm resolve to do better from day to day. As there are landmarks on earth, so there are landmarks in time. The past and future are like sealed books to us. The one is in the limbo of oblivion, while the other is in the womb of uncertainty. It is only the living present 
that is ours, and we must make the best use of it, ere it slips away through the fingers and is lost forever. Human birth is a great privilege and offers us a golden opportunity. It is for us to make or mar the same, for it is given to each individual to forge his or her own destiny as best he may, a quote from Kripal Singh titled, The Living Present. This is my Ode to the Living Ones Now, originally composed a couple years back for Guru Purnima, which is an Indian holiday devoted to celebrating living teachers, living masters. For it is the ability to truly listen that gives birth to an awareness of a message and an appreciation of a messenger. An infinite God could never have a limited number of inspired words or be forever bound by bookbinders. If there is no inspiration now, how could there have ever been any inspiration in days gone by? There is also no missing element or trace mineral once present in the water supply during the Middle Ages or earlier times, but now gone that once caused the appearance of prophets and saints and accounts for their absence now. What was true then is true now. The same need that brought great souls into the world during past centuries is still with us. My experience and belief is that the age of prophets, apostles, masters, or saints is still with us, that there is a living gnosis now. There are living masters in the world today. The reality and not the illusion of having a guru begins here with this openness to the possibility of living ones now. From my collecting and familiarity with all of these apocryphal writings that have come to us in this category of lost books of the Bible, I noticed that a lot of them fall into two categories. Some books are very dry, have no spiritual charge to them or value, offer no wisdom for living people. It's just information about people who once did some stuff somewhere, and that's great. You know, good time had by all somewhere in the past. But it lacks a kind of radiance or spark of life. But there are mystical texts and poetic texts that have that radiance, that have that spark, that offer wisdom that we can apply, that inspire us to interact with the divine on our own path, having our own journey in the here and now. And therein lies the difference. There are dry canal, there are sources of dryness, and you can really tell that some of these texts are very dry and don't offer anything other than information, perhaps. As it says in the Revelation of Peter, this is one of those Nag Hammadi library books found in Egypt. And there are others among those outside our number who call themselves bishops and deacons as if they had received authority from God, but they bow before the judgment of the leaders. These people are dry canals. That's fascinating. Dryness is what that kind of teaching feels like. But the writings of the saints and mystics are not dry, but have a radiance, an inspiration, a positive spiritual charge to them. Mm -hmm. 
and we will get to some actual living teachers during this podcast once I work through these different things I want to cover today. One day, the young disciples of Jesus were engaging in a conversation about how these are the end times or the last days. Sound familiar? They were talking about the latest speculations. This prophet said this in the scriptures. Another prophet said something else, etc. Their discussion sounded very much like what we hear people talking about today. Indeed, the world of religion is drowning in such dry speculation and intellectual information devoid of spiritual content in, in terms of spiritual charge or wisdom or depth. This discussion by the disciples prompted a fascinating response from the Master, who emphatically said, You have passed over the one who is living in front of your eyes and have spoken of the dead, Gospel of Thomas, saying 52. Venerating past masters from long ago is something that people do, and by that I mean uh, they develop a fondness for Yogananda or some teacher, perhaps a very fine teacher from days gone by or some past scripture. They avoid a living teacher and the challenge that that brings but they're very open to some past teacher but this can be a kind of demiurgical trap call trap of illusion venerating past masters from long ago is in the monmuk category which means following the dictates of one's own mind not in the gurumuk category or following the teachings of a living master. In other words, it's something done in the mainstream world of religion. When one has a real master, an actual living teacher, they will say things to us. They will say things contrary to the beliefs of the disciples sometimes, to make corrections or to remove illusions in the minds of their students. Not so in the case of those who venerate past masters. In that situation, one is following the dictates of the mind, projecting, imagining whatever they feel like. And there is no living teacher to set them straight. So the venerated past master ends up being like a hand puppet, like a sock puppet powered by the devotee that says only what the disciple wishes to hear and nothing beyond that. Nothing beyond that. Not much for change and growth. No contact with a living teacher who would have the ability to disagree with us about one thing or another and point out our shortcomings. No St. Paul who not only writes letters to Corinthians, but drops by and pays them a visit once in a while. A stand-up comic once said in his act, and this is back in the 80s, I can play the guitar better than Jimi Hendrix because he's dead funny, you know, but you know, there's truth, there's a germ of truth in that statement, right? In John 9, 5, there is a saying of Jesus that goes like this, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. The same is true for past apostles, prophets, and teachers. Their time came and went. And now it's up to the living ones to continue making disciples in the world, working against the forces of illusion that would otherwise hijack the souls into false paths and detours, thus preventing them from completing the journey during this lifetime, this time through. And venerating past masters as if they were, or taking the place of living masters, is one of those Kalistic or demiurgical teachings, call traps of illusion in the matrix that sometimes people fall into. The past master is not going to disagree with us, is not going to write a letter to us or an email saying, you, you're off here and there. The past master is just powered by our own projections and imaginations and are held captive to our own attention and attention span. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And then 
Jesus appointed spiritual successors, living ones, living successors to connect with souls in further future generations and in various regions of the world. I remember reading that his successor in Jerusalem, James the Just, appointed 18. There are 18 spiritual successors of his. So that's a long time. You know, that's many generations. Way past the first century, deep into the second and third century and so on. So they were into that concept of living apostles, prophets, teachers, uh, not just simply uh, reading a text and trying to figure out or interpret the meaning of that text from long ago. Consider the one who is alive while you are alive, lest you die and then seek to behold that one, and you will not be able to behold, saying 59 of the Gospel of Thomas. Bentley Leighton translation. Seek to see him. Consider the one who is alive while you are alive. The path of the living masters in Sethian Gnosticism. This soul will be made to follow another soul in whom the spirit of life dwells. Because she is saved through the spirit, then she will never be thrust into flesh again. A quote from the Apocryphon of John. This soul will be made to follow another soul in whom the spirit of life dwells. Fascinating. A Sant'Mat principle illustrated in an old Gnostic text from long ago, the Sacred Book of John. This soul will be made to follow another soul in whom the spirit of life dwells. Rumi says, if you seek to know God, sit at the feet of the saints. Whoever joins the immortal becomes immortal. Whoever delights in the living one becomes living. Indeed, who is joined to him who is immortal truly shall be immortal. And he who delights in the life will become living. I made a congregation of living ones among the dead, and I spoke with them by living lips in order that my word may not be unprofitable. A few mystic verses from the Book of the Odes. How a formless God communicates with souls living in worlds of form. The radiant form is the key to exploring inner space. The inner sought guru, God has made the reflection of his own form available in all the worlds. The formless one assumes forms in order to communicate with souls in all the realms and escorts them back to the original abode of the beloved. It works like this. The outer master guides souls to the inner master the inner master guides souls back to the formless supreme being. That's how a formless God communicates with souls embedded in worlds of form. Like here in the material plane. <laughs> This is a kind of gospel of hermeticism focused on finding a living teacher. Hermetic Tractate 7 from the Corpus Hermeticum. The Bentley Leighton translation. The greatest human evil is unacquaintance with God. People, where are you rushing? So intoxicated and having so fully drunk the strong wine of reasoning, unaccompanied by gnosis, unaccompanied by acquaintance. You cannot all hold it. Already you are about to throw it up. Stop! Get sober! Look up with the eyes of the mind, the eye of the soul. 
And if you cannot all do so, at least those of you who can. For the imperfection that comes from unacquaintance is flooding the entire earth, corrupting the soul along with the body that encloses it and preventing it from putting in at the haven of safety. So do not all be swept away by the main current. Rather, you who can must avail yourselves of a countercurrent. Take to the haven of safety, put in there, and look for a teacher to show you the way to the doors of gnosis or acquaintance where there is bright light, pure from darkness, where no one is intoxicated, but all are sober, fixing their eyes on that being who wills to be seen, but mentally with the eye of the soul, for that being cannot be heard or told of or seen by physical eyes, only by the mind's eye, the eye of the soul. That's kind of a gospel appeal from the hermetic tradition of Egypt. Find a living teacher. Don't all drown in this world of illusion and including religious illusion and teachings of one sort or another. There are infinite multitudes of those. But find that living teacher who is not a dry canal, if you will, is not one of the typical mainstream kind of exoteric voices, but has something to offer you on a spiritual level that will lead you to contemplation of the divine with your spiritual vision, your spiritual sight, the mind's eye, contemplating the Supreme Being. Someone that has a message like that in the here and now Seek to see God now, liberation during this life, a mystic poem of Sant Tulsi Sahib of Hathras. In this life, the concept of salvation all describe. To meet the Lord by dying while living, none discloses. They all speak of the goal of salvation after death. How to attain it while living, no one says. Were they to reveal the method of attaining release while living? Then alone would Tulsi be convinced of their words, who speak after seeing with their own eyes and teach the method of salvation during life are of the stage and stature of saints, for they reveal the quintessence of the soul. Just a footnote about dying while living or death before dying. That's a Sufi term for meditation practice, spiritual practice, contemplative practice, catching a glimpse of the, of the beyond during this life as a kind of dress rehearsal for the afterlife, if you will. Meditation is dying daily, dying while living, or death before dying, connecting with the kingdom of heaven while still alive. And that's a spiritual principle of Sant Mat that's also present in these old Gnostic texts. If you are tethered to the divine during this life, you'll continue to be in the beyond. But if you see nothing now, you know, if you don't break your ropes while alive, do you think ghosts are going to do it after? Just a, just a quote or paraphrase, Robert Bly's paraphrase of Kabir. If you're not seeing anything now, who knows about the next life? But to be anchored into the kingdom of God during this life, to be contemplating the inner light, to be baptized in the inner sound, to be traversing the inner regions, the kingdom of inner space, the kingdom of heaven within you now is a kind of true blessed assurance, if you will, is a, is a, is a way of already experiencing something of heaven now. In other words, heaven's not just for dead people. The world has 
has never been without a living master. Beneath all other impelling forces in creation, spirituality is the primary cause. That and that alone is the driving force that always leaps up to join its source. In every living being from tiny plant up to man, the spiritual flame of life is struggling upward and onward toward its source of being. And this process and this struggle must go on until the last speck of dust returns to the central fires of infinite being. The message of the masters fills the world with hope and at the same time it offers a rational foundation for such hope. It not only tells people what they should do, but it offers them a definite method of doing it. In the march of the ages, cycle after cycle, on every planet where human beings reside, the great masters are the light bearers of that world. Until the end of the ages, they will remain the friends and saviors of those who struggle toward the light. The divine spark in each one always struggling for freedom, striving hard against adverse currents, reaches out a feeble hand toward the master. In great kindness, the master takes that hand, unclean though it may be. After that, it may require years of patient hard work to build up the character, to strengthen the will and throw off the passions. Quotes, excerpts from the book, Path of the Masters, by Julian P. Johnson. This is one of my favorite passages from Swami Sant Seviji Maharaj, my teacher. Another common misconception is that prophets, saints, and mystics search for new truth. Rather, what they do is to simply remove the layers of dirt of accumulated misinterpretations that have corrupted the truth. Then the living teacher will bring forth the very same truth in a new light. The original truth must repeatedly be presented to suit the current age. Swami Sant Sebiji Maharaj, Maharishi Mehi Ashram. few sentences from Kirpal Singh. I want a group of satsangs of individuals to become centers of life, the new life of the spirit, and not organizations of power which imprison the fundamental values and stifles the living inspiration. Let me read that over again. I want group satsangs of individuals who become centers of life, the new life of the spirit, and not organizations of power which imprison the fundamental values and stifles the living inspiration. Always live in the living present, the living moment. The whole creation is sustained by God who is not a distant deity, but closer is he than anything else. God is love, each soul is a drop from the divine ocean, and the way back to God is also through love. to share some readings from living teachers. This is from Baba Ram Singh on Simran practice, also known as Manas Jap, the repetition of sacred names of God, as a key spiritual exercise that we not only practice during meditation in Sant Mat, but 
during free moments, d during the day, during the evening, whenever we can, to spiritualize life, to recenter in a world that's always trying to pull us out of our spiritual center. If we are not doing Simran, then our mind is scattered and all the outer things then affect our meditations. So we should spend as much time as possible and maximize our Simran. We should focus our attention towards Simran. Simran is the first step in Santmat. And it is only with Simran that we will leave out the nine doors of the, of the senses, he is saying and come to the tenth. Because our mind is impure, there are lots of thoughts which keep the mind wavering and impure. The term Simran means the repetition of sacred names of God. The master at the time of one's initiation gives you the Guru Mantra, a collection of sacred words, charged words that you repeat in meditation. But not only, as he is saying here, not only during meditation, but whenever we can to spiritualize our consciousness during the, the day, the work-a-day world. Whenever we can, we recenter by going to our sacred names, the mental repetition of various names of God to maintain a degree of spiritual charge as we go through our day, day-to-day -day life. Satguru is pure. By doing the Simran, remembering the five names, the mind gets stilled. And once the mind is stilled, then the reflection and the manifestation of the master within is possible. So the saints have always sung the praise of doing Simran. Santji has also said, if you do your Simran, then you will reach your goal. We are so used to our mind thinking and repeating worldly matters. So even if we are sitting quietly, our mind is busy in various worldly matters. The mind is so used to doing Simran of the outside world, remembrance of the outside world. So therefore, saints say that you don't have to change your attire or your clothes, and you don't have to change your food and eating habits. All you have to do is get attached to Simran. Simran is very important, so we should spend more and more time doing Simran. It is Simran only which will get us to our master within. Unquote. A passage from Baba Ram Singh. And when he's talking about changing our eating habits, uh, uh, I'm always mindful of those Western light and sound paths that are meat shabda paths that are, you know, into eating meat. Don't take that out of context. Baba Ram Singh is a committed vegetarian, and that's just how it is. But here he is saying that Simran, you know, we can change our consciousness through, through Simran by remembering God, by repeating God's name. We can spiritualize life and prepare so that when we do sit down to meditate, soon the light begins, instead of it being a long slog of trying to tame the rambunctious mind. You know, if we're taming the mind during the day by doing Simran as often as we can, by the time we get to our meditation, we are in much better shape and go within much sooner, much quicker, much easier. Swami Akutanand Baba about meditation practice says, you will become available to your true self by doing inner practice. This passage is from Sri Bhagarath Baba who lives at the Maharishi Mehi ashram. On closing eyes, everyone sees the darkness inside, no matter whether they belong to one creed, caste, country, or another, be they young, old, male, female, scholar, or illiterate. This darkness has not been created by humans or gods. This darkness has been created by the Supreme Sovereign God. There are three layers or coverings over the jiva-atma, individual soul, 
Those are darkness, light, and sound. Darkness is the shadow of the light. This darkness is the first layer that the jiva, the individual soul, or all beings, encounter. One who crosses this layer of darkness through a special kind of meditation sees the inner light within oneself. And this is a delightful hymn that I had translated fairly recently. It's by Sri Hari Charandas, who resides at an ashram just outside Lucknow, India. He was a disciple, he is a disciple of Sant Vimal Sahib in a lineage of masters that goes back to Sri Surswami, the great disciple of Sant Tulsi Sahib of Hathras. And there he is in his ashram, just outside Lucknow, a delightful soul. And he composes mystic poetry, just like the saints of old. The surat, or soul, is blind without the shabad. Say, where can she go? If she can't find the door of shabad, she remains entangled and wandering. In the three realms, Shabbat is foremost. This is taught by all saints. Das Harry Charan says, without Shabbat, the delusion never goes away. Shabbat, Shabd, the positive power, the divine light and sound. In the beginning, the Supreme Being said, let there be, and all became. This voice of God speaking is a vibration, is a power, is a transmission of divine sound and light. And so those of us who practice Surat Shabad Yoga are practicing the yoga of the logos, or in other words, meditation upon the divine sound current, this divine sound of the first cause of creation. And we reverse the process. The creation came into being, souls descended to various realms, including this Pindadesh, or physical plane of creation. And so we follow that sound back to the kingdom of God again. We retrace our steps. We follow the voice of God, the upward call that takes us back to the timeless spiritual realm. We invert, we reverse the process. We go within following the positive power of the light and sound and trace it back to its point of origin, God. Inner Light and Sound Meditation, Surat Shabad Yoga, has also been called the Yoga of the Audible Life Stream. That term, Audible Life Stream, was the invention of Julian P. Johnson, author of the book, the great spiritual classic, Path of the Masters. And finally today, another reading from a living teacher, someone who's with us right now at the time of this podcast, at the time of this recording, another living teacher. I realize these are lesser known gurus of Sant Mat. These are some of my favorite, and I enjoy sharing some of their teachings on this podcast. This is from Swami Vyasanand Ji Maharaj, spiritual successor of Swami Sant Sevi Ji in the lineage of Maharishi Mehi Paramahans, Baba Devi Sahib, and Tulsi Sahib of Hathras. The essential teaching of Santmat by Swami Vyasanand. In spite of the variance in their origins, the goal of the Sants, the saints, the masters, the Sant Sat Gurus, is one, the realization of God 
and the attainment of the state of absolute joy and peace, having considered the perennial wisdom found in their teachings, we can say with certainty that the underlying teachings of Sants are essentially in agreement. The question arises, what is this essential teaching? The answer is God is one, and the path to realize that reality is within each of us. The path is not found in the nine gates, i.e. through the sensory organs of the body, but only through the tenth gate, also known as the third eye or spiritual eye. The body cannot tread this inward path, only the inner consciousness along with the mind, intellect and ego principle can travel this path. However, during the last and final stages of the inner spiritual journey, the conscious soul or surat alone journeys the rest of the way and reaches God. This path is very subtle. Sant Mehi described it as being more subtle than even the point of a needle. Sants unanimously agree that the path to God can be taken up by any human being belonging to any caste, social status, gender, ethnicity, or country. A passage from Swami Vyasanand Ji Maharaj, one of those living ones in the category of Santmat, a living teacher of Santmat. On today's Santmat Satsang podcast, the path of the living masters, how a formless God communicates with souls residing in worlds of form. The outer master guides souls to the inner master. The inner master or Sant Sat Guru guides souls, that radiant form of the inner master guides souls back to God in the timeless spiritual realm. The outer teacher is necessary to get you to the inner teacher and the inner teacher takes you back to the supreme being again. There is this inward pull, but we need some teaching on the outside. You know, our conscious mind has to has to be part of the process. Being a disciple includes being a human being that's a disciple. And so we need that outer teacher in order to get to that inner realm. The formless God communicates with souls residing in realms of form by creating reflections of himself that work with souls here and there in various planes of creation including here in Pindadesh or physical, the physical plane, the physical realm. Thanks for joining me for Spiritual Awakening Radio, today's Sant Mat Satsang podcast. My name is James Bean. If you'd like to reach me, my email address is james at spiritualawakeningradio.com. Visit my website. You'll find links to podcasts available on demand, a whole archive of podcasts, the YouTube podcasts, the the Apple, Spotify, Libsyn, you know, world of audio podcasting these days, uh, Amazon podcast, various realms, all of these podcast sites pretty much at this point. Thanks for joining me today. Tune in again next week at about this same time for another edition of Spiritual Awakening Radio. Mm-hmm.